Okay, welcome everybody to episode 68 of the Volatility Barometer. I, as always, had a little bit of technical difficulties here. I had a microphone failure about five minutes before I turned it on. So I've got a backup mic set up. I just threw literally on my desk just in about two minutes. So just give me a thumbs up if you can actually hear me. I'm just going to proceed as if everything's normal. I think I got it all dialed in. So thank you everybody for joining me here. We've got a pretty busy one today. I wanted to get through something that I think a lot of you are really going to enjoy. So we're actually just going to do one segment. Typically, we might do two or three. But I also want to leave plenty of time to get everybody's questions answered. So we are actually going to be talking about eight different ways to short the UVXY. Now, of course, it could be short the VXX as well. Basically, VXX, UVXY, although the leverage factor is different, I basically use them interchangeably. Sometimes you just have to adjust the option contract size, but they're basically the same, both very liquid. So today we're talking about the UVXY. And this is just for idea generation for you guys. I'm sure that you've all got your own little style, your own ways of hedging and managing that risk, which is, of course, the most important part about it. But uh, I'm just going to do eight generic examples I'm sure we could brainstorm and think of 20 or 30, but I'm going to try to cover the full spectrum where the vast majority of traders are going to recognize something that they either do or that perhaps that they might want to start doing. And then we can dive into it deeper. If you have follow-up questions, maybe I can dedicate a future live stream to just that strategy and we can really go a lot further. So um, I really want to uh, um, make sure that everybody gets their questions answered. So I'm going to try to keep an eye on the time. I am a little bit sleepy. I know I always say that, but it's very late at night for me right now. It's one in the morning. And um, I'm a little bit extra tired, to be honest, because this month I have one day to go, but I've actually run 234 kilometers this month. So pretty good September so far. I can probably get one more run in tomorrow, pushing it up over 250. And that would be the equivalent of about six marathons. So a uh, pretty good month, pretty busy for me, but this time of night, I really do get sleepy. I will uh, try to stay awake for this one. I got a very strong coffee. Hopefully you've got one too. And let's go ahead and get started. So basically this sheet right here, this little keynote, it's mostly for me just to organize my thoughts, but hopefully everybody can see it as well. And we're going to get started. So like I said, eight different ways to short the UVXY. And of course, if you are a volatility trader, you know that I'm going to be focusing, as you know, as the old saying goes, the risk reward ratio. I do tend to favor that risk side, managing the risk more than the reward. I always feel like if you can get that part down, then it's actually much easier to just ramp up the performance down the road rather than trying to do it the other way, trying to set up trades that are ultra risky from the start and then trying to manage the risk from there. I think that's a terrible way to attack the problem. So I will always, of course, my own conservative self, I will, when I'm speaking here, I will be basically defaulting to more risk reward uh, on, the, on the managing risk side. But let's get started with what I believe. These aren't ranked. I didn't put them in order, but I am going to start with the very first one, which if you've followed my live streams, you know this is going to be the one. Three, two, one, I'll give you time to take a last second guess which one is going to be the worst method, but there it is. Of course, short UVXY call options. I hate call options on the UVXY, and it is probably not for the reason that people think, but I'm going to go through what I think about this specific trade. So the typical way, and like I said, um, what I'm trying to do here, I understand that everybody's going to have their own style. So as I'm talking, I'm trying to just cover what I believe most people are doing with their strategies. I understand that your, your layering system, your hedging might be different, but let me just break down what I think most people do when they're selling calls, or at least what they, at the very bare minimum, should be doing. So the first thing that you're going to be doing, obviously you don't put all your money into your UVXY strategy. So I'm using a trader here that has a $100,000 portfolio. Presumably, they're going to have about 80% of their capital in different strategies, maybe more equities related, perhaps even some bonds or, you know, whatever you do with the rest of your portfolio, 20% is going to the UVXY strategy. But the problem with UVXY calls, of course, they are the most risky trade in the volatility space, you know, by far. So what people typically do is they will tell you to divide your capital up into smaller layers, and you basically deploy the first layer, 
when you initiate the trade, and you're reserving that extra capital on the sidelines just in case something happens, which isn't very often. You know, 80, 90% of the time, that first layer is going to make their money because, you know, the VIX futures are in contango about 84% of the time. Most of the time, you're going to get that first layer done, and it's going to be fairly uneventful, and you're going to make your profit. Now, the problem is what I just said there is something that a lot of people gloss over. But it's very important for you to understand that what I just said might sound like an advantage, like, oh, he's going to win 90% of his trades. This is awesome. And he's going to have three layers left over to defend the position if it goes against you. This is not an advantage at all when it comes to shorting volatility, because what ends up happening, there's two major problems with short calls. There's, there's many more than two, but I'm going to go over the main two. The first one is you're going to make a very low rate of return. And the reason is because you've divided your capital, you have to. Of course, you can't deploy all your money on day one. It's going to, you know, once every year or two, it's going to cause you major problems. Once every five years or 10 years, it's going to be an absolute disaster if you do that. So divide your, divide your capital. What ends up happening is you get a lot of very easy wins on layer one, which isn't going to make you any money, right? Remember, you've subdivided your capital into four ways. So $5,000 per layer. Let's just go ahead and open a trade and I'll show you what that would look like. So I'm just going to use the next available monthly cycle. 21 days to expiration seems fine. And we're going to just pretend that someone is selling a short call, right? A naked call. Probably, I don't know where you like to sell your calls. If you are a call seller, I hope you're not. Hopefully I can convince you otherwise today. But let's just say you go a few points out of the money. 17 seems fine to me. You do want to bring in a decent size premium. You don't want to go so far out of the money. This is kind of a sucker's play. You think, oh, it's never going to get to 23. The thing you have to remember is when it actually crashes out of control, it's not just going to go to 23. It's going to go to 100. So it doesn't really matter how far out of the money you go. You really do want to pro probably get a little bit close to the money and just bring in as much upfront premium as you can and then manage the trade later on. Again, you might have your own style, but I think that for a, somebody who's you know a little bit out of their mind and does actually sell naked calls, probably you want to approach the money. Not at the money, but let's just use this 17. So look what's happening. First of all, this is an extremely capital inefficient trade. So one contract is probably going to cost about 1,600-ish with the UVXY at 1587. So you might be able to get three of these, right? Three contracts, you are looking, this is your trade, you're looking to make you know, roughly $400 on this position. Now, $400 on a $20,000 strategy allocation, this is not a very good rate of return, right? This is basically one layer. You're going to make $400 if it goes in your favor. $400 on a $20,000 account size is nothing. That's the point, is that you're basically picking up pennies. You're still on the hook for the losses when it spikes against you, and you're going to have to go to layer two, layer three, layer four when it goes really far against you. But 80 to 90% of the time, you're barely going to have any capital allocated here. Most of your level one trades are going to be successful. So what is $400 profit? That's nothing, right? You're talking about, a, a, you know, a couple percent, maybe if you get the monthly cycles correct. Even if you had 12 months in a row where it went perfectly well, you're not going to be making very much money. And this is why I always call selling naked calls a Twitter strategy. The reason it's a Twitter strategy is because it actually looks very good from a you know, win rate perspective. You can win 80 to 90% of your trades and really week in, week out, you can be posting on Twitter, oh, I made my max profit. This is awesome. Look at how easy this is. The problem is you're making pennies on a quarter of your capital. This is not a good way to trade. The SVX or the UVXY this year, I mean, it's down, you know, pretty <laughs> an insane amount but you're gonna make 1%, maybe 2% on these monthly cycles. This is an absolutely terrible way to trade from a profit perspective. But it gets worse than that because the second major problem is on the risk side. The hedging style of hedging against spikes is to add more risk. Now, just as a general rule in trading, don't ever hedge positions by adding more risk. You always hedge by taking off risk or literally matching inverse risk. But in this case, you've left aside three other layers that you probably are gonna start allocating. 
and it's going to start going against you and you're going to start allocating, but you're not reducing your risk. You're adding to it. So what ends up happening is this is called martingaling when essentially every time the first position goes bad, you add another one to try to cover up the first one that went bad. And then you add a third layer and a fourth layer. But remember the UVXY can go up a thousand percent, 1500 percent in a major crisis. You're talking about something going from 16 to, you know, 150, maybe 200 in, in a very major crisis. You know, the pandemic, of course, it went up 1300 percent. This is what that layer one trade looks like. You're talking about a trade that, I mean, if you don't put inverse risk or take off risk, your, your first layer is down 50 grand. That's forget about all the other layers you put on. Your entire account is blown up in, in a very short order. So people don't actually realize this when they're putting on the trades. They think, oh, I mean, I'll be fine if the UVXY goes to 25. We're not talking about going to 25. We're talking about what it actually does every several years. It's going to blow way past. So this is a two-sided thing. Basically, Martin Galing, I'll explain it super quickly. I know trading isn't gambling, but you go to the casino, you're playing roulette. You basically put a, a small amount of your capital on red and you, 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 you spin the ball, right? And maybe it lands on black, so you lose your money. You add more money thinking, okay, no problem. I'll just add enough money that I've covered my losses from the first one. Well, wouldn't you know it, it's black again. You add a third layer, no problem. I've still got two more, it's fine. You will get to that point sometime. Trading, gambling, casino, no matter what it is, betting on sports, everything in the world, at some point, five blacks in a row is gonna come up and you're gonna lose all your money. That's what martingaling is. So don't ever hedge by adding more risk. Always hedge by removing stuff from the table. And that's not what a naked call strategy is. So for that reason, I absolutely label selling naked calls as just a kind of a sucker's play because it looks very easy. It's one of these high win rate strategies that lulls people to sleep, but you're, you're gonna make a very low rate of return long-term because you're making, every time the trade goes well, you're making pennies on the dollar on a quarter of your assets or a third or whatever you do, even half, this is terrible. So the, the key to trading is getting the most amount of money into the market with the least amount of risk so that when it goes well, you can actually ring that register and make some profit. I'm not trying to put on massive risk to make 1% on my capital. That's a really poor way to trade. So the second way, it gets slightly better here because of course a straddle, go ahead and throw one of those on. If you did a straddle, likely you'd probably go a little bit in the money, right? So maybe favor it a little bit. A straddle is going to look like this. And essentially a straddle is a little bit better because you're getting two-sided premium. So you can actually bring in a little bit more money. It's the same problem. It's super capital inefficient, probably even more than the other one. So you might not even get three. You might only get two. But you can see the price right here. It, if it bleeds down a little bit, you can actually make a, you know, a little bit more money, 600, 650. Most likely it won't. And you could even skew it even further if you thought UVXY was going to go down a lot. You could actually set it up so the current price is here and it's just going to kind of bleed down into the profit range. There's nothing wrong with the setup and knowing that the UVXY decays. Of course, remember, we know that, you know, long term, the UVXY daily, it's about 0.41, but weekly, right? 0.21 long-term decay. And we're talking about two, three week cycles here. So maybe somewhere in the range of six, 7%. It's not a bad idea to lead the trade down here. But again, when the thing spikes, it's not like an extra dollar premium is going to save you from what's going to happen, right? It, it doesn't do anything from a risk reward perspective. Straddles are just basically almost as risky as naked calls. They just sort of help that profit side a little bit. But again, I'm going to go ahead and say those are garbage, too high risk, way too little payout because it's just so capital inefficient. You really should stay away from that. The third one, and we're going to wrap this up, kind of all three of these in the same category. I think they're all garbage, but short UVXY shares. Uh, one of the reasons why I like to sometimes make very short TikTok videos, and I'm not a TikToker, of course I I, I tend to babble on and I like to have long form content, but they can actually explain something much quicker. So I've got a, you know, I don't know, 45 second little thing. Here's why you shouldn't sell UVXY share. I don't ever short the volatility ETPs directly. First, there's big fees involved because you're borrowing shares to short and it's not cheap. This is many multiples more expensive than standard trade fees for some of the other option trades. So this is always a major headwind. Second, they're not always available to borrow. You might think you've got a great trade setup that you want to 
jump in on, but if there's no shares to borrow, then what does it matter? Third, you can have your shares called away on you at any time, so you're not really in control of your own trade. Plus, you should know that the time where they are most likely to get called away on you is when you least want them to be. Probably it's going to be when you're doing damage control on a trade that isn't going well, and you might want a little extra time to fix your trade, but you're not going to be able to because the shares get called away on you. And lastly, and probably the biggest reason here, when you short shares, you have unlimited loss. We're talking about volatility ETFs here. They can spike up hundreds of percent, maybe 1,500, 2,000% if you're talking about the UVXY. Why on earth would anybody trade unlimited loss when one flash crash will wipe out your portfolio? Look at me, a uh, successful TikToker there. But um, yeah, general point applies there for those four reasons. Short, shorting the shares outright is also a pretty bad idea. Now, the one benefit I would say to shorting, and it, nothing is you know all risk, no reward. The one benefit to shorting, so it might look something like, you know, if you just shorted 100 contracts there. Remember, we've got how much did I say we have to work with? Um, Twenty thousand dollars total capital. So if I just scaled this trade to 20,000, let's just take my little calculator, 20,000 divided by, it's trading at 16 right now. So you're talking about 1,250 shares. So if we did that, 1,250 shares. The, the one benefit that I could say to using the short UVXY directly is that the option Greeks are not gonna matter in this case. You're not gonna have to worry about Delta or Vega, Theta, none of that stuff. It's basically just a pure price play where if it goes down a dollar, you, you make a dollar. If it goes up a dollar, you lose a dollar. With all the other options that we're talking about, you know, I always say anybody from any background can trade options. You don't have to be a math whiz to do this, but there are a few extra variables. You are going to have to actually watch those Greeks, and you're going to have to understand how the trade changes dynamically over time. But if you're talking about shorting it directly, I mean, honestly, who cares? It's just where do you think the price is going to go? It is, of course, an unlimited loss trade, so it's terrible. But uh, for that reason, again, it's just not a good idea. So that's the third one. And now let's start getting into the next five, which I actually like. So hopefully some of these ring true with you and you think, wow, that's interesting. Maybe I should focus on that instead of focusing on these three. This is one of the things that I always kind of nitpick with people on is they always, you know, I say, oh, you should never sell UVXY calls. It's a terrible trade, super capital inefficient. You're going to make a very low return and you're taking on too much risk. And inevitably someone will come along and they'll say, well, no, that's not true. I actually made money last year shorting calls. I know, I'm not saying you can't make money doing eight of these methods of shorting UVXY, but the game that we're playing as traders is we're trying to make the most money with the least amount of risk. We're trying to maximize our efficiency of trades, not just be positive. I understand that anything can be made to work, my token golf analogy for the day, I try to keep them to about one per, per live stream. But you can have a completely garbage golf swing, and if you practice hard enough, you can actually make it work. I mean, I, I play golf in Taiwan sometimes, and you know, not for nothing, but Taiwanese people, uh, they tend not to have fundamentally sound golf swings for whatever reason. I think there's a lot of cross teaching. You know, this guy shoots 100, so he teaches his buddy who shoots 120 like he's a coach or something. But um, yeah, you can have a garbage golf swing and you can actually, if you work really, really hard at it, you can make it work. Or you can just put in a little bit of work on the front end, clean up your fundamentals a little bit, and then you won't have to work nearly as hard to shoot the same score. Trading is kind of the same thing here. We're talking about, yeah, sure, you could work you know, 10 hours a day for 10 years and you could have all these complex systems and yeah, maybe you can make it work. But I'm trying to help you out to do the best strategy with the least amount of risk and practice involved. So short UVXY put options, one of my personal favorites. So essentially what this would look like, throw out one of these, we're going to bow, I don't know, the 13 looks pretty good to me. You could even do the 14. I like to bring in some premium. So a short put is going to look like this. Now this is the opposite direction, right? So the one thing we have to notice here, there is zero risk on a volatility spike. Right Here's the price right now, and if volatility spikes, you actually make your money. So not only is there zero risk, it's actually mathematically beneficial. But I still consider this a short volatility strategy because what you want to happen is you want to be selling your naked puts, I call them cash secured, but essentially they're naked, while the UVXY is decaying downward. And if that were to happen, you're actually picking up significant premiums as you're selling these positions. 
And all you're really hoping for is that it doesn't breach this line and go all the way over here. Let me just, while I'm talking here, I realize I forgot to open one of my spreadsheets. But essentially, it's a short volatility trade because I actually want the UVXY to go down to about 14. And then I would sell my next one maybe around 12. And then I want it to go down to 12. And I would sell the next one at 11 or 10. And that's how you make your money shorting volatility. Another benefit here is I can actually get all my money into the trade. I could put the full $20,000. And the reason that I can feel comfortable doing that, let me just get this proper spreadsheet open. Of course, I'm going to have to click all these windows out so it doesn't crash on me. But essentially what we're talking about is the wheel of fun strategy that I trade. And a lot of my live streams, we've talked about this. Wow, this is beach balling forever. Apologies. Um, but pretty much every week on our live streams, I typically enter a trade. I'm not going to today because we have a lot to talk about. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm getting error messages everywhere. I may not actually be able to open this spreadsheet today. Everybody knows my battles with spreadsheets. Um, sorry. This is very, very annoying to do on a live stream. How long should I wait for this to go? Okay, essentially, who cares? So what I'm essentially hoping happens is it expires around 14. But let's say that it expired below 14, somewhere over here. All I would do in that case is I would be assigned my shares. And then I would turn around and sell a covered call and I would actually get paid another lump sum premium. And typically the covered call premium is significantly higher than the short put premium. So not only is there no risk on the high side, but I can actually roll this trade into something that makes even more money. And I get to have all my money and all my capital to work. So let's see. Nope, it's just not going to go. So I really actually like short UVXY put options as well. And I think you should pay attention to my live streams if you want to learn about that, because it's actually pretty fun to do live. And we've been doing this for uh, quite a while now. We've had several trades going. The next one... Iron condors. Now, again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one because I actually trade iron condors as a standalone strategy at VTS. So one of our five strategies is iron condors, and I typically don't do volatility ETPs. I typically do stocks, bonds, gold, things like that. So I personally don't use UVXY for iron condors, but I want to show you what it would look like because this actually, if you're not trading the VTS strategies, Iron Condors actually is a pretty decent trade on volatility ETFs. So an Iron Condor would look like this. What you would do is you'd actually expand the strikes. So maybe I'm just doing this on the fly. 15, 16, maybe get something kind of close there. And then the other one, we could do a 13, 12. And what I would personally do is I might actually try to squeeze this one outside of where the current price is. So yeah. That trade looks good right there. So the current price is right here at 16. If the UVXY stays where it is, you make your profit, right? If it goes down like we're expecting it to do, about 14 by, you know, the 21 days from now, somewhere in here is what we would expect based on the decay factor. That would be a good trade as well. And the only thing that you have to really worry about is the extremes. But since it's a maximum loss trade, it's a defined risk trade, this is actually something that if you layered small enough, you could just layer a whole bunch of these. Maybe every four or five days, you could throw them on. And as the UVXY is decaying downward, you're just layering these iron condors on top of each other. And you're basically just tracking the price lower with a defined risk trade. Now, the only thing you'd have to really get right here is you don't allocate too big to each trade. Because remember what I talked about before, martingaling, the reason that ends up being a problem is there is going to be a market environment that shocks you. You think, oh, it'll never go five layers. Well, it will, right? So with iron condors, you don't want to put up too much money for each trade because you will at some point, if you do this for the next 20 years, which is what investing timelines typically are, at least 20, at some point, you're going to hit one of those streaks where everything you do is wrong and you're going to put on a trade and it's going to lose and you think, well, it's not going to go again. It is going to go again. You're going to lose five in a row. So don't put $5,000 on each trade because you could actually end up just chaining together and having a really bad environment where you just lose four or five in a row. So let's say you put $2,000. For an iron condor, it's just the, the amount of capital you're putting up divided by the maximum loss. 
So if you're getting 47 right now, 47, you just divide by uh, 53 cents, and then you can see the contract size, 37. That uh, does seems like a lot, but there you go, $2,000. So another thing you could do, the UVXY is priced very low right now, so I'm doing $1 strike gaps. 37 is fine, but if it starts to get a little bit too high on you, you can make a $2 strike gap between them, and that will significantly reduce the number of contracts. But here you go. This trade can actually now make $1,700. You can see it right here. You can lose $2,000. When I hover over the profit, you can make $1,700 putting up $2,000 of your capital. And then, of course, the trick here is there's a very high probability. I wouldn't say very high, but let's say 80% probability. You'll probably win four out of five of these. This is actually a pretty good strategy to chain together on very small allocation sizes. So that is the iron condors. Let's see if I can find the next one. There it is. UVXY put vertical options. This is also another favorite of people's. And again, a good trade. This is a defined risk trade. Let's go to fire one of these on. I am going to right now put on a put vertical. So what this would look like is perhaps you would do the 1615. Let's see what that looks like. 65 cents. That's about right. So you can see the price is here. And essentially, it's a defined risk trade. So you just trade very small. Let's say $1,000. $1,000 divided by 65 cents. What is that going to be? $1,000 divided by 65 cents. We're talking about 15 contracts. So there you go. This is your trade. You can lose as much as $975, $1,000. You can make $525. And again, this is a trade that you would want to layer. So you don't just do one big one per month. You try to do five or six small ones every month, and you just keep going. You're layering this trade as you're tracking that UVXY lower. We know that that's what typically ends up happening. And this is also a great strategy because you don't really have to worry about that next flash crash or cyber attack. You always want to be protected in the beginning. Remember what I said, my style is to find a structure that's extremely safe when you start. And then down the road, once you know how to manage that risk and you know that you're not going to blow up your account with verticals, as long as you're keeping them small, with iron condors, keep them small, you're not going to blow up your account. With short VXX put options, I mean, how far can it really go? And then, of course, when it goes down that far on the rare occasions, presumably the rest of your portfolio is net long the market and you'd make more money on your portfolio than the, the short VXX put option loses. So you don't really care either. These are strategies that are extremely safe from day one. And then you can learn to layer and add in risk and try to figure out ways to maximize your profit. You don't start with risk and then manage it. You start with safety and then add the performance. And you're going to have much better success. I do want to go off on a slight little side tangent here because when I say in my thing here, long UVXY put vertical options, I know there's going to be many people in the comment section right now saying, well, actually, I prefer to sell short v UVXY call spreads, right? What would that look like? The truth is they are mathematically identical. People don't think they are, but they are. A long put vertical and a short call vertical are the same trade. In fact, the long put vertical is better. That's why I always default to it. But let's go ahead and go through this exercise really quickly. So the reason people think short call verticals are different than long put verticals is because they're not using the same strikes. What people will typically do is something like this. They'll do a 1617. So the short strike is out of the money and you look at the price right here, it looks like it's in the money and all, all it has to do is stay there. But look, your premium is only 25 cents. If you normalize the strikes, which I'm going to do now, 15 to 16, look what happened. This is the exact same trade as the long put vertical. Look at the premiums, 65 and 34. These are mirroring each other. Now watch what happens when I click around. This one, let's do 15 contracts of this as well. This trade can make 525 and lose 975. This trade can make 510 and lose 990. It's the same thing. The only reason why it's a penny off is because the bid ask spread is going to be, you know, displaying on the toss platform one penny difference. Sometimes it's two cents, sometimes it's the same. But you have to understand that these are the same trade. So the reason I always default to long put verticals is because when you look at this trade, which one of the strikes is the short strike? It's the 15, right? So this trade on the day you open it, 
that short strike is not in the money. Now, it is important to recognize that early exercise of options isn't really something you have to worry about when you're talking about UVXY. First of all, there's no dividends. There's no corporate announcements. It's extremely rare to get an early assignment. It's actually never happened to me before, but not saying it couldn't. Typically, if people want to hold the shares, they'll just buy the shares. If people want to short, they'll look for an opportunity and they'll short. People almost never exercise these options on you. But it is worth noting that when you're doing a long put vertical, the in the money strike is further away from the current price today. But if you look at the call vertical, even though this is an identical trade mathematically, which strike is in the money? It's that 15, right? The 15 is already in the money when you initiate the trade on day one. So it's actually the long put vertical that is slightly safer. I would say mathematically they're identical. You can do either. I knew somebody's going to say it as soon as I say long put verticals. This is actually the better trade. But the reason it's good is because it's a short ball trade. It's defined risk. You can layer a bunch of thousand dollar trades rather than one big one. And that should work out really well. The next one, long UVXY put options. This one is rather obvious. Basically, when you look at the UVXY, what do people think about? Well, I'll just buy some long put options. The only thing is here, what I tend to do is I call it stock replacement. I don't actually buy as many puts as I possibly can. I'll go into that in a minute. But essentially, if you wanted to um, understand one of our strategies is tactical volatility. There is a course attached to it. It currently has 16 lessons. It'll probably go up to about 30. But one of the sequences here is about a 12-part series on stock replacement. And stock replacement is the best way to do put options. And I'll explain what I mean in a second. So first of all, I wouldn't do 21 days. If you want to take the course, there's a free trial to VTS. You don't have to pay the money. You can just sign up. And look, you didn't hear it from me, but you could cancel within two weeks and you could get the course for free. Uh, don't tell anybody I said that. Um, but I would do 112 days. I typically do 100 to 130 days to expiration. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell an in the money put option somewhere close to 55 delta. All right, so this is the delta column. I'll look somewhere here. This is fine. They're all kind of the same. But the one thing that you'll notice is put options are actually pretty efficient. So if I took all my $20,000 and I bought all the put options that I could, that would actually be a very leveraged trade and I wouldn't want to take that. So what I do is I use stock replacement where I'm essentially simulating the price of the underlying with a mid to high delta option. So instead of just dividing by the 1055, all we do is we take our $20,000. This is an advantage to buying put options. You can get all your money into this trade at once. You don't have to do that, you know, 80% win rate picking up pennies like short calls are. I can get the full value in, but all I do is divide by the price of the UVXY. So it's 15.69 right now. I would just divide by 15.69 and I'm gonna open 12 contracts. So this is what that would look like. This is your, your stock replacement trade. You can see the price is right there. The pink line is the daily profit line. Of course, we're gonna go nowhere near expiration. So just ignore the turquoise line. It's all about the daily profit. And again, this is a trade where it's a 55 delta. If it goes down, you make about 55% of the profit. If it goes up, you lose about 55%. It's a very straightforward way to short volatility. And of course, you can just get out of the trade when you get your signal to exit the trade. But this is, this is very good because it's very directional. And it is actually, you might think, oh, this is kind of the same as shorting the UVXY, right? Well, it's not because it's a put option. Let's say you got a cyber attack or a flash crash and something terrible happened and it went from 15, it could easily go to you know 40 or 50. Look what happens. Now, it's not going to be a fun day to lose $8,000, right, of your 20. But if you were short the UVXY, you could lose way over 100% of your capital. When you're doing stock replacement with put options, you can only lose the premium you put up. So I'm only on the hook for $10.60 per contract. This isn't, you know, it isn't terrible. If, you know, once every 20 years something horrendous happens, you kind of have to be prepared for that. And this trade is, has already built in risk management, which makes it a, a really good starting place. Like I said, you can probably try to find ways to tweak it a little bit, but start with safety. And this trade is great because of course it is defined risk, even though, like I said, taking a 40% loss wouldn't be fun. That's a whole lot better than taking a 200% loss if you open the wrong trade structure. 
So long put options are awesome. And then my favorite, of course, everybody knew this was coming, but here we go with our put butterfly options. These are, you know, maybe not the best. It's probably top, top three, top five, but I think personally just the most fun. So let me show you what a butterfly looks like. We'll go back to that 21 strike, 21 days to expiration. So a standard butterfly option. I don't know if you've ever traded these before. They're a lot of fun. I think I'll probably convince you to start once you see this because it's pretty cool. 16, 15, 14. So let's do something that looks like this to start. So what you're looking at, here's the price right now. And again, it's that very familiar structure like I was talking about with the straddle, for example, or the iron condor, where you actually want to kind of lead the price lower. We know that 80, 90% of the time it's going somewhere here. So if you set up a butterfly, these are dirt cheap. They're actually extremely capital efficient. So you're talking about a 12 cent premium right now. And again, don't put all your money in it. A thousand is plenty. So let's size this thing. Where's my calculator? A thousand. I don't know how many, I mean, you could do something like that. You could do eight or nine contracts. That would be fine. So you're talking about risking a hundred bucks. You can potentially make 672. Now you're not going to get it at the exact peak, but the point is if you layer a whole bunch of these, you can actually start to see how a, a large percentage of them are gonna make a little bit of money, right? And that's how you accumulate it. But what about a broken wing butterfly? So instead of 16, 15, 14, I'm gonna move this to 13 and watch what happens to the trade. You can see how it happened. Here's the current price right there. And what I did breaking the wing is I transferred the risk from the high side down to the low side. Now, why would I do this? Of course, you could break the wing the other way. You could do a 17, come on, clicker. You could do this and you could break the wing the other way so that you're, you've got zero risk on the downside and then you can just trade it as a pure short vol trade that has a capped maximum loss. But I actually like to go this way and I'll tell you why. So right now you can see the structure of this trade. If it stays where it is, I make a good rate. Of, I make 40, 461 bucks. If it goes up, still make some money. If it goes down like I'm expecting it to, I can make even more. And then if it goes down a lot, like to 13, that's when I'm gonna lose my money. But again, I've already touched on this before. What's gonna happen to the rest of my portfolio if occasionally I get one of those broken wing butterflies that loses the maximum amount, right? I'm only gonna allocate about 1% of my capital to that trade. The rest of my portfolio is going to be net long equities, net short vol. I'm probably going to be holding the QLD for the NASDAQ, the SVXY, might even be holding the SPY, might have a couple of iron condors on. The rest of my portfolio is going to love the fact that the UVXY went from 16 to 13. That individual trade might lose money, but my portfolio doesn't care. I don't care which strategy profit comes from. If I have you know two that lose money and three that make money and they, I make more than I lose, it's all I really care about, right? It's about portfolio totals. And this is not a trade that I'm actually uncomfortable putting on at any time. There is quite literally zero high side risk on this trade. UVXY could spike to the moon. I make a little bit of money. It could go down where I'm expecting it to be, you know, 14, 15, somewhere in there. Statistically speaking, hopefully my spreadsheet is now working. There's the wheel of fun, finally, 10 minutes late. But statistically speaking, and you know, 14 to 21 days, it's going to go down about 5%, maybe 10%. So if it goes to 16, statistically 1440. That's where I'm expecting it to land. Just long-term averages. Um, you could even skew it further if you wanted. That's the great thing. You could go 15, 14, 12. Let's say you're really worried about it going super far. Well, now it's got to go all the way down to 12 to lose my money. And all I did is I lost a little bit of my high side profit. It's still up, but you know, less. You can do your risk wherever you want. That's the awesome thing about broken wing butterflies is I can transfer the risk to anywhere I want on that trade. So obviously a personal favorite of mine. So of this list, you might be asking, well, okay, there's eight ways to short volatility. I don't have all the time in the world, right? Probably most of you aren't like me. I've been doing this, you know, literally everybody knows I'm a workaholic 10 hours a day for 18 years now you probably don't have that much time. And like I said, you could grind it out and you could make all of these work reasonably well if you wanted. 
but there are some that stand out as clearly superior to the others, right? In my opinion, this is what you're looking at. If you wanted to say, hey, iron condors are worth it as well, no problem. I have no problem with that as well. But like I said, I already trade an iron condor strategy, so I don't personally do them on the UVXY. But I would focus on these four. If you're, if you're wanting to be a short vol trader, I would just say, look, you're probably gonna get derailed. You're probably gonna lose too much money. You're gonna wonder why your profit's extremely low and you still feel like you can't sleep at night if you're doing these three, right? Again, not saying you couldn't make a net positive return if you're extremely good at it, but you're not gonna feel comfortable when you go to sleep and you're gonna be picking up tiny pennies on what ends up to be a very high win rate, but a very low profit strategy, right? The UVXY goes down 20% this month you make 1%. Easy max profit win on a quarter of your money for a dollar twenty premium. I mean, why even bother, right? So in my opinion, I would focus on these. And for me, if you want to understand how I really trade volatility, I have a more diversified portfolio. Again, I'm a workaholic, so I don't expect anybody to be able to trade all of these. But if you're looking for a little bit of guidance, of course, that's what I'm here for. Our tactical volatility strategy, this is basically covers kind of two of these, long SVXY, which I like, the inverse products, because of course they are capped at 100% loss, that counts for something, but it's also 0.5 leverage. And like I said, start with safety and then ramp it up later. The SVXY, you can't really get into too much trouble on that one. So this is actually a very good strategy for us. Also, just FYI, remember there is a course on this strategy. And I actually really like doing this as well. It's very trend following. so. The risk management in this case is whenever we get a signal to, you know, elevated volatility, we are basically going to be exiting the SVXY and firing into the gold as our safety position, which has sucked royally this week, of course. Gold is a terrible asset. I always rail against it. But for the long run, it is actually a pretty good safety for just a little window here. And then if things get really bad, we'll go to long volatility. So that's our tactical volatility strategy. And then we also have the volatility trend, which trades broken wing butterflies. And you can see that one here. It also has a 20% allocation. And today we actually initiated a new trade. So let's check out what my new trade that I just opened today looks like. It would be, hopefully I got these numbers right. It would be this one. So you can see I actually went really conservative this time around because just the way that the market is landing right now, if you know this debt seal or not the debt ceiling, the government shutdown stuff, if it happens to get resolved, it is possible that the UVXY flushes down next week. So I went pretty conservative this week. You can see the price is all the way over here. I, I can lose a tiny amount of money on the high side, but really I'm expecting it to kind of go back to that, you know, 13-ish range. You can see it was just there a few days ago. It is just best practices to assume that it could flush down again. So I'm actually pretty confident that, you know, if the market resolves itself and everybody calms down, it could quite easily be at 13 two weeks from now. So that's the trade that I put on, but that's our volatility trend. And it also has a course. Now, right now there's 10 lessons. I think I'm planning about 22 for this one, but again, same thing. Like I said, you didn't hear this from me, uh, but you can actually just take the VTS free trial and if you're really diligent for a couple of weeks, or maybe you want to stick around for a couple of months and, and see what it's all about, you can get three of those courses for, um, you know, I hate talking about money, but for not a lot of money. People sell these types of things for, you know, thousands of dollars. If you want to join the community and rip through the courses and, you know, I'm trying to add lessons every week, you can go ahead and do that. But that's what I would say for the two for VTS, that's in the green. And then, of course, if you follow my live streams, you know that I also talk quite a bit about three others, which are VTS options. Why am I talking to myself here? There you go. See myself uh, staring at my screen. So the Wheel of Fun strategy is the one that I was talking about that my spreadsheet wouldn't load. Let's see if it loaded up now. The Wheel of Fun is basically this, where you sell that cash secured put. And I'm basically hoping that I get assigned and I can kind of rip around this wheel. Like I said, in our live streams, I have actually been selling quite a few of these. So, oh, don't touch anything. It's going to freeze on me. So essentially, you know, I'm on trade 40 for this year for this strategy. And I have two layers because I really like this strategy. So I basically, 
Um, I have one that I call conservative and one that I call, um, sorry, conservative and aggressive. This one, I try to bring in really big premiums. You can see like these numbers are much bigger, you know, sometimes $1.70, 262. But the conservative strategy, oftentimes you can see like five cents, six cents, 15, 15. On the conservative side, I'm not trying to get assigned. I'm just trying to rack up a, a decent profit for the year. And then the aggressive one, I, I just, I just go for it. I try to bring in the biggest premiums I can and play around with that. But that's what the wheel of fun is. And it's really a personal favorite as well. Number four, volatility step is using verticals. So again, I'm covering all of these ones here with our VTS strategies. This one is again, VTS options. It will be introduced, but just a super short teaser. It is exactly like I just explained. You sell those long put verticals. You can do short call verticals if you like, even though they're mathematically identical. And we are basically just trying to layer a whole bunch of these. I call it the volatility step because you can imagine what's happening. Every contract, you're basically just trying to step down towards what naturally happens. And every so often it spikes up, but fortunately when it spikes up, that's why we like to trade limited loss positions because every now and then it is gonna spike up and you might lose two or three of these. So that's why I also go very, very conservative on the allocation size. You might get a spike that doesn't just do one week and then it's gone. It might go for a month and you might lose three or four. This is why you always wanna go conservative, but that's a good strategy. And then the last one, VIX options, it's basically straddles, head straddles on the VIX index, kind of my flagship strategy at VTS options. So I think people will be pleased to know that that will be coming back. I'm not going to say soon. I've been saying that, but I'm so busy. It's, it's hard to put out 150 videos on the side while I'm still managing VTS. I have to put together, you know, hundreds of, of courses as well, but uh, it's getting there. So that'll be fun. So anyway, hopefully people got a few ideas there. They saw something that I said and you think, wow, that's a good, good foundation to start off. I'm not saying that any of those are fully fleshed out. Obviously I have my own style, my own layering, my own position sizing, but um, yeah, I, I tried to be fair. I tried to not just be that guy sitting on a pedestal saying, don't do this, do this. Tried to give you eight but hopefully I was uh, laying it on pretty thick that there's four or five of those that are clearly superior to the other ones. You just, if you're a trader, you have to accept that you're gonna be doing this for 20 years. You don't wanna do anything that can't stay the course, right? If, if you know that, wow, I'm pretty uncomfortable with these positions, I hope I can get through the next six months or the next year without any major spikes. If that's what you're telling yourself in your head, I'm sorry to tell you, your strategy is too risky. It should be comfortable, smooth sailing. You should sleep like a baby and you should be able to do this for the next 30 years. That's what we're, we're trying to do here. Get the maximum amount of, of capital into the market as we can with the least amount of risk. A couple of those things, naked calls, straddles, selling UVXY. Come on, it's a complete violation of everything we're trying to do. So um, I would recommend you steer clear, but I'm not gonna tell you what to do with your money. So there you go. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's get into the Q and A. I will stick around cause I know that went a little bit longer. Let's try to fire through some of these. Hopefully a few of the questions are specific to what I was talking about, but you can also email me and I can plan out a full live stream covering, you know, the, the strategy that you liked best that I ripped through there. Okay. How many 1% and 3% max loss options trades do you allow simultaneously? What are you trying to ask there? Okay. Sometimes, I mean, if I whiff on your question, if I totally misread it and I, you know, I, I don't understand what you're asking, then um, apologies, try again. For volatility trend, I allow two layers. And remember for these, they are extremely capital efficient. These are butterflies. So that's the trade that I showed you. That's this trade. Very, very efficient trades. So yeah, come on, come on, toss. What's going on? It won't let me grab, there we go. Um, you have to be very careful with allocation sizing on these because you do sometimes get a maximum loss. And like I said, don't be that martingale guy that goes to the casino and says, oh, I could never lose three in a row. You can actually. So um, I allocate super small. And for that volatility trend, we allow two layers. 
Now, if you were really good at it and you had a very net long portfolio, like for me, typically when I'm kind of layering into our volatility trends, I will most of the time be net long here. Certainly by the time I get to layer two, I will already be net long the NASDAQ, probably short vol. And then I'm very comfortable. If you wanted to overlay a couple of more, you're not going to get into a whole lot of trouble with those. You're really not. But you don't want to go more than one to two layers. And then for iron condors, we allocate 3% to each trade because we use 50% stop, 50% stop gain. These are much safer, so we can actually layer several of these. But I stick to three. Again, if you wanted to go four or five, you're not going to get into a whole lot of trouble with iron condors when you're using stops, especially if you use some diversification, like I always talk about with, with me, you know, the five point diversification, you know, strategy, time, price, volatility, and asset class. If you're not only doing the NASDAQ, but sometimes you're throwing a, a TLT bonds or you're, you know, some of them are 75 days to expiration. Some of them are 50. Some of them you initiated with a 40% vol. Some of them came in at 65. As long as you're doing that, you really can't get into a whole lot of trouble trading iron condors, as long as you use a stop loss, right? Use that 50% stop based on the premium collected, should be just fine. Uh, so to answer your question, I think what you're asking, two for vol trend, three for iron condors, feel free to go rogue against my signals and add one or two more if you like. Question number two. On the vertical spreads and diagonals, what allocation do you typically choose? I think I covered that, but let's just, um, like a vertical spread, if I had $20,000 of capital dedicated to this strategy, I would actually only do $1,000 allocations, something around that size. And so you really would never allocate 20% of your capital to it because you're going to have, you know, 16% of your money just sitting there in cash. So again, you could put that in the SHV or some type of bond fund getting 4% a year. But um, 1000 bucks for verticals off a $100,000 account, it's about right. 1% allocations. For what was the other one? Diagonals. Diagonals, you could probably treat them very similar to iron condors and calendars. Uh, they're all kind of the same trade. Slightly different structure, but iron condor, calendar, butterfly, and diagonal. As far as risk-reward ratio, they're very similar. They just they have slight variations, but basically 3% would be just fine there. So again, if you had 100 grand, take 3%. You dedicate three thousand dollars to that trade, and diagonals are very capital efficient. So you'd probably get you know eight to ten, maybe fifteen contracts with that. All right. Our volatility and daily email metrics compute with yesterday's close price or with today's real time. Okay, good question. So when I send out for our volatility dashboard, let me scroll down. Down here, essentially every day probably, you know, roughly an hour after the market's open. I don't gather any data before the market's open. So basically my day looks something like this. I just log in and I put all my VIX futures data. I put all my, you know, cash VIX data. I, I've got all the, you know, S&P stuff that I need, short vol, all these indexes. Sometimes I'll, you know, every month I'll update those, but all the volatility ETPs, you get the point. I basically go across and I input a pretty large chunk of data roughly an hour after the market's open. And then when you see them in the email, all of these are basically 30 minutes before I send the email. So it's the most up to date that I can get with it. So you can get all the volatility dashboard. Our beta dashboard tells you what our market exposure is at the time. Right now we're kind of in mostly safety, so it's only 0.39 beta. But um, all of these metrics, everything you see here, this is from basically 20, 30 minutes before you see the email. Uh, very up-to-date numbers. And then I also, just for my own sake, at the end of the day, I update it and I do everything end of day prices. But you guys don't actually get to see those. You guys see the most up-to-date numbers. And then for me personally, because you know over 20 years, I wanna look back and analyze data. And we don't have a whole lot of intraday values for anything else I use. So I like everything I'm looking at to be end of day. But for the email specifically, your volatility dashboard is the most up-to-date values. <clears throat> Why do you do the Wheel of Fun on VXX and not UVXY or UVIX? Um, I do the Wheel of Fun on both VXX and UVXY. It's just like I pointed out, 
for me personally, because I do trade a full portfolio of volatility strategies, not just one or two, I'm very active in my trading. Um, you know, I, I typically will use either one. Like right now we're in UVXY, but I have no problem using VXX for butterflies as well. This is interchangeable. Volatility steps interchangeable. But sometimes I'll just get into a routine basically. So 2022, for example, because the UVXY didn't do its reverse split, it just kept taking forever. I just stopped trading options on UVXY and we focused on the VXX. And then the VXX did its reverse split and it went back up to the 40s and 50s. And it was perfect for option trading. So for about eight months there, we were just every single volatility trade was VXX. And then UVXY did its reverse split. So now it's back on the table. It really doesn't matter to me. Like I said at the top of the live stream, aside from the leverage factor, right? VXX being one times and UVXY being 1.5 times. Aside from that, they're basically tracking the same index, right? That SPVX, STR index. That's where the values are coming from, both of them, basically. I mean, inverses and leverage factors and whatnot, but it's basically the exact same instrument. No difference between VXX and UVXY day to day, other than one to 1.5. So feel free to use either one of them in your option trading. They're both very liquid. They're both no problem at all getting your fills. Do whichever one you like. I like to mix and match. I've got five or six strategies I have to get into. So you don't ever want to double up on, on, on positions, right? If you get too many trades in the money, you have to really pay attention. Okay, well, I've got a vertical here for the, you know, the October 13th, whatever it is, got to be a little bit careful. You're not actually reversing those positions because you're trying to do something else. Um, that's why I keep very detailed spreadsheets, of course. UVIX naked calls are more risky. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but again, kind of the same concept. UVIX is just two times leverage. Now it's slightly different because the UVIX doesn't track the SPVIX VX STR index. It tracks the long vol index, which is slightly different. Better structure for sure, but they fixed up the other ones as well. So you can consider it materially identical. It's just two times leverage. So in the options world, the difference between VXX, UVXY, and UVIX is really nothing, right? It's the same thing. Now, UVIX doesn't have the option volume, so it's definitely off the table, but you could, if it had good volume, you could just make that work just, just as easily. And then you're just dealing with a, a, a just simple math equation of adjusting the leverage factor. It's, it's really simple, but they're all interchangeable. It just so happens that, I mean, SVXY is, no, it's not good enough, but it's probably third or fourth. Um, yeah, it's just VXX, UVXY. Do everything on those. Are some stocks ETFs better than others for the wheel? Absolutely. The wheel of fun, if you're doing it with stocks, basically what's happening here, it, it will depend on your style, of course. But remember my style, if you've been focusing on our live streams the last, say, two months, my style is, at least for my aggressive layer, to take assignment of those shares. I actually like getting assigned the shares. You can see this didn't work out very well for me. I'm actually, this is still up money this year, but I actually like getting assigned the shares and then just firing off those covered calls. On my conservative side, you can see it's mostly short puts because I'm not actually trying to get assigned. I don't mind getting assigned, but this conservative layer is basically just a, you know, let's try to see how many weeks in a row I can not get assigned. This one, I fire aggressive. So it's going to depend on you. But if you're trying to get assigned, then you're looking for things that have higher volatility because you're going to get really good premiums. And you're looking for things that are um, that, that can move around a lot, of course, because that's kind of how you maximize your profit in a good year is to get the big premiums, to get that m week or two period where you're kind of a little bit nervous, but you just trust the system and then you're going to get it. But if you're talking about, okay, your strategy is you don't want to get assigned, then you're not going to want to use those. You're not going to trade biotech companies on the wheel of fun if you don't want to get assigned. You're going to try to trade things that are extremely stable and predictable. And then, of course, what's that going to mean? Lower premiums, right? The reason that you get good premiums in those juicy contracts is because the thing can blow up in your face. That's what we want. Remember, I always use a 10% stop loss. So it's not like I'm overly worried, but I would never use a biotech. I mean, what if it drops 50% a day? I mean, that's just no fun. 
So yeah, it matters, but it depends on you more than me. I can tell you what I do. I like stability more than, you know, the ones that move around a lot. But um, some people like to, they like to go with those ones that can really move. It's all up to your style. Are there stocks and ETFs? Is that the same question? Oh, you just added to it. Assuming liquidity is not a problem, are stocks with a higher IV or higher IV rank generally more profitable? I mean, as far as profit goes, depends how you look at it. So in an individual year, if you wanted to maximize your profit, you would probably go with higher IV stuff because you can get those juicy premiums. And if it works out well, you can have a fantastic year. But my conservative brain, of course, is factoring in the next 10 years. I would rather have 10 years where my average return is around 12 to 15% and have it be very consistent and nothing really blows up in my face. That's my style. If you did the high IV, you know, they, they, they move around a lot. In a single year, you can do a lot better, but you got to know you're going to have a few years where you get gut kicked and you might actually have a losing year. When you factor in long-term averages, probably, again, I don't want to tell you what your style should be, but probably favor slightly more stable stocks and ETFs. I should have read them all and then answered. And then it's better to open a new position every two weeks for the wheel of fun, or should I use all capital for it on day one? Is the market so efficient that not waiting is better? That's a good question. So again, what I personally do doesn't have to be what you do, but I have two layers. And remember these, for me, I don't want to mislead people on a, on a live stream and make people take on more risk than they should. Try, like, I, I hate that saying, well, I'm a professional, I can do this. But I really have been doing this for almost two decades. So what I'm comfortable doing is probably not appropriate for a lot of other people. But these are both not using any of my capital. These are both margin overlays that are basically using buying power instead of actual allocations. So I allow myself two of these. And... What was the question? Lost my train of thought. Um, I, I, trust me, I was on a roll there. Um, is it better to open a new position? Capital on day, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So allocating capital, I allocate two, right? So I'll divide it up into two pieces. But what you were saying about, is it more efficient to do shorter contracts or longer? Let's just take an example. What is the UVXY? Let's assume it's at 16 right now. If you were to do weekly contracts, sell just outside the money. You can see that this one gives you a dollar three, right? And this is for a weekly cycle. Watch what happens if you go two weeks out, the 16. You see how it's a dollar 44 or something? Watch if we go three weeks out. The 16 is now $2. So basically, if you do weekly cycles, you get your dollar. If you do two weeks, you don't get $2, you get about $1.40, $1.50. If you do three weeks, you don't get $3, you get about $1 or $2. So the longer you go, the premium starts to get progressively lower. So you would be better off in a perfect world to do weekly cycles, which is what I do. I don't know if you guys were, you know, you don't have to pay attention to this. This is just my own spreadsheet. This is not for, you know, any of you to, to look at, but you can see I'm basically doing weekly cycles, right? And even in this one, even though I don't want to get assigned, I am kind of doing mostly weekly cycles. So in a perfect world, that's what you would be doing. But risk reward. So the longer you can push it out, the more out of the money you can get those strikes. So if you did two weeks away, you could actually drop it down to 14 or 15 and still get a decent premium. Whereas if you do seven days out, if you go too far out of the money, the premium is going to go to one cent pretty quickly. So Again, it's up to your style. For me personally, I'm quite comfortable taking assignment of those shares. So weeklies work great for me because you maximize your profit. And then I also get several weeks where, oh, now I'm in a trade. Now I can get those really good covered calls. So what I would say in general, if you're a beginner, and I don't mean to be derogatory, it just means new to trading. I mean, you'll, you'll get it. Don't worry. A year or two in, you'll be an expert. But if you're new to it, I would stretch it out to two or three weeks, maybe even monthly cycles, and I would keep it way out of the money. So if you're selling UVXYs at 16 now, go a month out and do the 14 or the 13 put and just watch it go and do five, six months of that and get comfortable with the idea and how you're going to feel when you get that first assignment. Because you're going to think, oh my God, the trade's gone wrong. It's terrible. I got assigned. 
I can't believe it. It, I, it was at 15 and now it's at 14. You're going to feel tense. But once you do this a thousand times, you're going to just be like, oh, I got assigned. Okay, well, next step, right? It's, it's very emotionless. But if you're a beginner, stretch out always, always. Same with iron condors, 75 days out. Don't sell weekly or monthly iron condors. Stretch those contracts as far as you can. Be as safe as you can. And um, start with safety and then add profit later. That's what I would say. I've heard that holding leveraged ETFs long term is a bad idea, but you seem to hold QLD for months at a time. Why is that not a problem? Good question. So you're talking about the gearing effect of leveraged ETFs. And yes, you're right. So we don't use the triple, but we do in one of our strategies, defensive rotation, we use the two times leveraged QLD. And for me, um, slight difference between end of day and signals that go out. But uh, yeah, we basically held the QLD for, I think it went all the way back to March. Um, there we go. March 29th. We just rode this thing for, I, I mean, six months. There's no reason to exit something. I'm a trend follower. So if I enter something, there was a little bit of shake and bake here, and I entered somewhere around here, no reason to exit, right? So we just held the two times NASDAQ for six months. But what you're saying is, well, it's leveraged, right? So there's that problem with the gearing. The thing that you have to understand is that that's not always a negative thing, right? There are times when that beta slippage helps you and there's times when it hurts, right? And so for me, because it's a timing strategy, I keep flipping back and forth here, sorry. But because I'm only holding equities when it's advantageous to do so, these are the sections where you would not want to be holding a leveraged ETF. And so if you are buy and hold, yes, I would recommend that you don't hold leveraged ETFs. But, and that's because basically losses are far more punishing than the gains help you. So even though you might think, well, I make so much money in good times, when you get one of those drawdowns, it's going to be so punishing that it's going to actually take you quite a while to recover from. So you don't ever want to hold them buy and hold. That is a very big mistake. But because we're cycling out when volatility reaches, you know, anywhere 65-ish, 60%, we're out. I'm actually only subject to a little bit of that negative slippage. Sometimes we get it for a couple of days and then we're into utilities or into cash and we're good to go. So I'm not actually subject to it very much. I can actually illustrate. I think I've, where is, where is my chart? Let me stretch this out. Let me see if I've got it open here. You can actually see what I'm talking about, why you don't want to buy and hold these things. So this was updated when? July 31st, so it's over a month ago. Um, don't assume these numbers are totally accurate, but look at this. This is the one times leveraged NASDAQ, right? It had a maximum drawdown of 38%. Currently it was just down a little bit last time I updated it. And the return to break even is basically the drawdown, right? But if you do the two times QLD and you buy and hold, that drawdown is way more punishing because always losses are more costly than the gains help you. This is that issue with holding things that have massive drawdowns. Look at it, it's 37% away from breaking even. The single Qs is only six and a half. You'd think, oh, the two times Qs, shouldn't it be 13% away? No, it's 37. What about the TQQQ, the three times NASDAQ? This thing was over 100% away from breaking even. This is the problem with buy and hold these, these leveraged ETFs. Sure, it's a lot of fun in good times, right? If, if everything's going well and you're holding the triple leveraged NASDAQ, awesome, high fives all around. But when you get into that drawdown, of course, it's going to draw down way more severely than the single one. And now you're down 80%. It's going to take forever. Like, like ARC ETF. Let's laugh some more at Kathy Wood. Um, <laughs> everybody who follows me on Twitter knows I've got this, you know, I'm always kind of trash talking the ARC Innovation ETF because I think it's just such garbage. I can't believe this lady still gets herself on the news every day. But um, look at ARC. It's 237% away from breaking even. It's going to be a decade. Come on, Kathy. You're, you're pretty much done. If you load a portfolio with the biggest garbage names you can find or double or triple leveraged ETFs and you just hold them, well, guess what happens when there's a drawdown? You lose your, you, you lose your fund, basically. So uh, that's what Kathy did. That's what would happen if you held the NASDAQ. But getting back to your question... We actually cycle out of risk and into safety 
quite quickly. So the gearing effect of the leveraged ETFs, not a problem for me, at least in theory, right? You could get a market where I'm in it for a few days and then you get grinded a little bit, but it's never going to be any sustained problem for me. So I'm totally comfortable with tactically rotating in and out of leveraged ETFs. I answered this already. Hopefully you were here for that. It's structurally identical for anybody who wasn't. Long put verticals, short call verticals, mathematically identical. They are not different trades. One of them's not long and one of them's not short. They're mathematically the same thing. But the long put vertical is slightly better because the in the money short strike on a long put vertical is out of the money when you initiate and it's in the money for a short call vertical. So early assignment's not a big deal anyway, but if you were going to default to one of them, might as well go to the safe one. Long put verticals. What was your custom way of measuring performance again? I remember it takes in something like the last five biggest draw. Oh, my VTS performance score. Um, for that, just watch the video. That's, well, I say it's a good video. The view count on that thing is uh, not that impressive. I think it's because my, um, my thumbnail was terrible. You know, it's just my investing performance score, but nobody knows what performance score means. So there's only 2,300 2, views on that thing. But um, essentially what the performance score is, let me shut myself up here. Try to find it. It's basically this. So instead of using the Sharpe ratio, which is very flawed, instead of using the Ulcer Performance Index, which is actually quite good, but this is better, I think. This is basically similar on the numerator. So annual return minus risk-free rate. But the denominator for me personally, I think the pain point for investors isn't, variance. It's not volatility. It's not standard deviation. It is just the maximum drawdown, right? That's the moment where they're trying to leave is when you've breached their risk tolerance. So all I really want to know is what's my rate of return in relation to the average of the three largest drawdowns. You kind of want to keep that number as high as you possibly can. So for example, I think I said here, anything less than zero, of course, is garbage. Over zero means it's technically an investment worth you know, it, at least it's better than the risk-free rate of bonds, which I typically do. But you want to go over one, which would mean that your rate of return minus the risk-free rate is larger than the average of your three largest drawdowns. So the S&P 500 for the last 25 years or so has a annual rate of return of about seven and a half percent. If we use a risk-free rate, average of 10-year treasuries or whatever it is, over that time period, let's just call it two, just for easy math. So that's seven and a half minus two, five and a half. If the average of the three largest drawdowns is five and a half percent, that would be a comfortable thing to follow because you're getting rewarded for taking on those drawdowns. Unfortunately, with the S&P 500, the maximum drawdowns 57%. There was another one at 50, another one at 45. So the performance score of the S&P 500 is absolutely horrendous. In order to get your 7.5%, you have to suffer drawdowns over 50% to get 7.5%. Who thinks that's a good equation? Apparently, most of the world, because they tell you to buy and hold the S&P 500, they don't actually tell you what it's going to feel like when half your net worth is gone. They don't tell you that part. But yeah, as a performance score, it's really terrible. So with VTS, of course, we had a 26% drawdown. We had a 11 and a 10 so average of the three largest drawdowns is like 16, 17% and rate of return is higher than 17%. So it does get uncomfortable sometimes to follow a portfolio. Everybody's, even mine, which is very safe, but you're getting rewarded on that higher end because it's over one. So for me, if I was going to make 10% a year, and if you told me that I had to sustain drawdowns of eight to 10%, great. Uh, that's fine. That's a totally normal risk-free rate. If you tell me I'm going to make 10%, but I have to suffer drawdowns of 60%, well, no, I'm going to try to find something else. So um, hopefully you saw the formula there. But yeah, just Google VTS performance score. There's a full video there, and you can add to my low view count on that video. I have another one. Do stocks have higher returns on average in a 5% risk-free rate environment than a 1% environment because investors would buy bonds otherwise? Well, in theory, of course, 
if, if everybody was a rational investor, the higher the risk-free rate gets, the more people would dump their stocks. Now, just anecdotally, it doesn't seem to play out that way. I, I don't think investors are quite as rational as you would think because with rates where they are right now and the risk where it has been in the last couple of years, you'd think stocks wouldn't be doing as well as they have been doing. You'd think that real estate would have already kind of collapsed. You'd think that a lot of these things would have happened, but they just don't. So there's no way that I can answer this. What should happen and what does happen, different things. And I'm not much of a macro guy, so I don't have this data on hand. But just from what I view in the market, it doesn't seem to be the case that, you know, there's just this, you know, one-to-one -one relationship. You know, you give me 8% in bonds, I'm going to sell my stocks. You give me 1% in bonds, I'm going to buy all the stock. It doesn't really work out that way all the time. At least not right away. Maybe on a delayed two or three year window, maybe it does, but. Okay, have you ever investigated trading gold outside of your tactical strat strategic defensive portfolios? For example, selling iron condors. Well, we do sell iron condors on gold. So like I showed, we have three layers that I allow myself. And typically the first layer will always be equities. Second layer is usually but not always equities. And then, oh, you're looking at the wrong one. And then the third layer, like if I add a third one, I might add gold because it's crashing recently and volatility might give us a little bit of decent premium, but I could throw in bonds. I could throw in a utilities or a real estate. Some type of different asset class would be diversifying this portfolio. And then of course, iron condors, you're going to make the most money if you have a diversified iron condor strategy within a diversified portfolio. So this one is independently safe on its own you know, defensive rotation is independently safe on its own. It's going to cycle out into safety. We're going to go into gold and long vol, you know, cash and long vol. You get the point, right? So yes, you would, uh, gold would certainly be one of the assets that I would say iron condors are fine. But I actually had a strategy in the past that uh, I still traded on my own, just a little bit, just for fun. I never give up completely on things, but it was called the gold barbell strategy. Because essentially, if you think about gold, when are the only times you want to hold gold, right? If, if, if you could be strategic with this, you'd say high vol for sure is when people typically think, oh, yeah, people are cycling out of stocks and into gold. So high end barbell, you could go for gold. Low end is actually good too. People are surprised by that. But volatility under, say, 20%, gold's a pretty decent holding there as well. So I called it the gold barbell strategy where you just have to figure out what to do with your capital in the middle. Anytime volatility, say 20 to 70%, what do you do with that? Well, equities, short vol, you know, take your pick. But um, I just don't do it anymore because gold, gold in recent years, and I don't know if it's because of Bitcoin. I don't really know if it's rates. Something's going on with gold that it's just so consistently disappointing, right? It never used to be this way. And now I, I try to limit my holdings of gold as much as possible. GLD used to be a standard go-to safety for, you know, super low vol or higher vol. It's just frustrating these days. But unfortunately, the market doesn't give us much else for safety. I mean, if you take utilities and gold, real estate off the table, what are you left with? Emerging markets? They're absolutely terrible during a crash. So, you really got nothing. Um, for the wheel of fun, especially on volatility ETFs that have a strong decay rate, is there a reason to go for a longer time period than one week? You could, like I said, if you're new to this, you could. Um, one thing that I do, of course, is just, I like to know numbers. So first of all, I know the decay factors. And then you can just punch it into a decay calculator if you wanted, something like this, and just punch in the price today. Here's the decay factors. And I can basically get a reasonable ballpark where these things are going to be. And it doesn't always play out. Of course, sometimes it crushes more. Sometimes it doesn't move at all. But what you really want to do is just gain your experience. And in my experience, even though week to week tracking these numbers doesn't always hit, it you know, once you factor in the fact that you're subdividing your account into much smaller pieces and you're being consistent week to week, all of a sudden that 
good old law of large numbers where the more occurrences you do of something, the better off it's going to be result-wise, it actually starts to really mimic down to those decay factors. As long as I maintain my 10% total value stop loss, just keep going. Just go right through those trades. Sometimes they lose, but you just keep going. I don't mean to tell you you go right through losses. You have to gain that experience first. So, oh, why am I so... Not that it matters. I've got a standing desk here, so adjust it. Look like I'm sitting on the floor in this live stream. All right. After your assigned share, a lot of Wheel of Fun questions. There is a full course coming. It's, it's an awesome strategy. Um, okay. After your assigned shares in the Wheel of Fun and you start selling covered calls, if the price is too far below your cost basis, do you raise the strike price to save your trade or sell? I don't want to go into the numbers too much because um, this, is, this is basically my own trading and it's based on, you know, again, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but it's based on many years of experience. So what I do might not translate to what you do, at least not right away. But I, I believe what your question is, is when you get assigned your shares, what if it just keeps decaying downward? And that actually, for the wheel of fun, basically 2023 has been a bad setup for it. Now I'm still up money because I've got a lot of experience doing it. But if you look at this, this isn't actually ideal for a wheel of fun. This is good. Flat periods are great but really persistent long-term flush downs are not actually that great. So what happens if you sold one at 48, you got assigned, and now all of a sudden it's down to 23? Well, I'll show you what happens. You just keep dropping it down. So for here, I got assigned 1350, I had to drop it to 1250, and then eventually I had to drop it to 12, and then I got my shares called away. And this trade lost a chunk of money when I exited because I got assigned at 1350 and I actually only got 12. So it loses a chunk there. But all of this added up to more than I lost and I'm out of the trade with a, with a really nice profit. Remember, this is just an overlay. I'm not trying to you know conquer the world with rate of return here. 10% a year would be great. But you can see what happens. Now, sometimes it goes so low. That's why I said 2023 is really not great. You can see here, I got assigned at 50. And this is my this is my live account. Like this, this actually happened in real time. I got assigned at 50 and I didn't get the shares called away until 25. So you can see I'm just dropping down consistently because it might never come back to 50. I can't, I can't sell $50 covered calls and expect it, oh, someday it'll get there. No, it won't. These are volatility ETFs, they decay. And that's what we want. It's a short vol strategy and we want this to happen. It's just, it happened so rapidly, right? It got cut in half. Oh, don't do that. Uh, it got cut in half in price in no time at all. So I kind of took a big loss there, but you can see the premiums along the way, they got pretty close. And then most weeks, you know, it's been profitable. So my, what am I up? I'm up 6.57 for this year. Like I said, this is a terrible year for this type of strategy, but I'm still up you know, six and a half percent. And I could actually sell one right now on camera if you wanted me to. Um, but yeah, I'm up, you know, six, seven, eight percent. Took took a big hit on this one, but I think that's what your question is. And that's why I think a course would be great is because you got to know what to do in that situation. If you get assigned, you can't have anchoring bias where you're thinking, okay, I got assigned at 20. I have to get out at 20. No, you might get assigned at 20 and get out at six. But as long as you're selling those premiums all the way down and you're using a 10% total stop loss, that's another thing I should have highlighted really quickly is that at no time during that devastating from 50 to 25, at no time was I down more than 10% on this trade. So I just kept going. It got close a couple of times. I was down five, six, 7%. But you sell another big covered call and you go for another week and you sell another one and you go for another week. And look at my cost basis. It's going down every week. So if I'm in at 50 and out at 25, I'm not going to say it's no big deal because those flush downs don't actually happen that often. Remember, this is the third longest VIX futures contango streak in the history of the VIX futures. So since last October till right now, 
those volatility ETPs have decayed a lot, right? A lot more than average. And I'm still up 7%. So um, it can be done. But again, it's about experience and getting comfortable with what assignment means. Most people panic. And that's why I'm going to have to be there to walk people through it and do live trades week in and week out and have the course and teach it correctly. These little blurbs I talk about on a live stream might give people the wrong idea, but I really want to take it seriously and make sure that nobody gets themselves into trouble. And there is a way to devastating decay factor and still come out ahead. It's actually really fun when that happens. Your take on the mob looting big stores happening in the U.S. these days, it's getting scary. I tweeted out recently, I think it was today maybe, maybe it was yesterday, I don't know. Um, I basically said, because when I first moved to Dubai a few years ago, a lot of people, you'd be surprised how much outright hate that I got. I mean, people yelling at me saying, aren't you, you know, you're a traitor to your own country, you're, you're moving out of Canada or the US or moving out of the West and you're going to these, what do they call them, blood money countries. Um, Dubai doesn't really have any oil anyway. Um, but more and more as time goes by, and I believe in five or 10 years, people are going to look at me and go, ah, I should have listened to you. I should have moved to the Middle East, you know, 10 years ago. But um, yeah, that stuff doesn't happen where I live. Same with Taiwan. I'm in Taiwan right now. None of that stuff happens. So I, I don't want to get canceled on, on YouTube or anything, but um, I'm not really into all that crime let people just pour across the border, um, you know, all the woke stuff, all the things about the education system. Uh, you're free to have your opinion on those things. And if you think that that makes the country a free, wonderful place that you're, you're so open that you don't even prosecute criminals, like look at how, look at how great we are. We don't even stop people from stealing Gucci bags. That's how, you know, that's how woke we are. Great. That's fine. I'm not going to criticize that. That's, a country that I don't live in. I'm not American, so I'm not saying that, you know, it's wrong. But from my perspective, I do think in the most compassionate way possible, countries should have borders, countries should have laws, and they should be enforced so that people feel safe and schools should be protected and all these things. So, you know, what's my take? There are places in the world where that stuff just doesn't happen. So all of Asia is fantastic. Taiwan, the crime rate's ba basically zero. Um, Dubai, of course, it's basically zero. Education's good. Healthcare's great. Country's awesome. It's not nearly as expensive as people think it is. I mean, there's a lot of things I could go off on a tangent here, but don't want to get myself canceled. So let me just say it's odd. It's, it's a weird place we're in. And even in the U.S., if somebody could have forwarded you a video, like go back 20 years, somebody forwards you a video of what's happening, you see these people like literally through the front bay window of a luxury store and you get security guards just letting them leave. You get, yeah, it's, um, you wouldn't believe it as an American. But, you know, the Overton window changes and, and people have their opinions. And I know there's a lot of people who think, yeah, you, it, it's compassionate. So it, it's not for me to say. Um, I look at countries and where I live. I'm not one of those people who thinks I have to live where I was born for the rest of my life. So I shop around and I look for, the, you know, advantages and disadvantages. And I do think like Canada's just no thanks. Vancouver's kind of where I'm from and where I would move to and where I would live. But right now, no thanks. It, there, there's a few things. No, not, not into that. I'm actually enjoying Dubai and Taiwan as a sort of half year, half year combo. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming and asking all the good questions. I am always here. I am pretty sleepy. It's, what is it, 2.30 in the morning for me? And I ran six marathons this month. I'm tired. For smaller accounts in VTS, do you recommend scaling into strategies or allocation among all? This is one of those things I, I do sometimes hesitate to answer because I'm not a registered advisor. I cannot give you any personalized investment advice. 
So I can only just speak in generalities here. I'm not speaking directly to you, but our strategies can be traded on not a whole lot of capital. So these are ETF here, here, and here. So those three, defensive, tactical, and strategic, they're just ETF strategies. Iron condors and, and broken wing butterflies are super capital efficient. So you could probably trade this whole strategy on $10,000 or even less, like six, $8,000. But if you had that level of capital, you have to understand that there is going to be an inefficiency where for an iron condor, for example, the difference between 20 iron condors and 21 iron condors is negligible. The difference between one and two is pretty huge, right? There's going to be an inefficiency of just the scaling of your account size. Same with ETFs. The difference between opening 150 and 151 shares is nothing. Nobody even worries about that. The difference between opening two or three, that's a big difference. So you kind of have to weigh your account size with the efficiency. And so what you could do is choose two or three of the strategies to start and focus on those. So I would say if you are doing that, defensive rotation and iron condors should be a staple, right? Those two for sure. So you're gonna trade the defensive rotation as your staple core allocation, and you're gonna trade iron condors for sort of the support. It's a market neutral, it's un, you know, uncorrelated to the rest of the portfolio, uncorrelated to the S&P 500. You're gonna do those two as your staple. And then the more your capital builds, you can start adding them in. So the third one, if you were just, if again, I'm speaking general, just me personally, the third one I'd go for the tactical vol, right? Just throw in a volatility strategy, that would work well. The fourth one, I'd probably go tail risk. And then the last one, if you have 10, 15,000, $20,000, then I would just go for the full portfolio. Again, I'm speaking in generalities. I am not giving you direct investment advice, but uh, yes, you probably the defensive and iron condor by themselves is a really great portfolio to, uh, you know, to start with and it's plenty safe enough. They're both independently protected on their own. Be fine. QQQ is down from this morning when the email went out. Is the signal still good? Yeah, I noticed it was slipping. Is it negative? That's crazy. I kind of felt like that. Be oh, it's actually... So, I mean, it it's down 0.44. So, yeah, the signal's good. And the reason the signal's good is because one trade per day, right? It's It's not beneficial as a trader to be watching the market. Okay, I'm in now. I'm taking the trade. And then an hour later, oh, it's out. Okay, I'm going to sell it. Okay, it's, I'm, I'm in again. There's only an hour left in the day, but I'm in now. You could just drive yourself crazy with this. So I do one trade per day, one signal per day, data collected around 1030, email sent out around 11, and I'm done. And I don't touch it again. That's it. That's the daily signal. And it's not beneficial to go in and out intraday. It's just not. Every, you know, it's a 50-50 crapshoot, basically. For every time that you think, oh, I should have exited and done the other one, you'll find that there's an, another opportunity where you shouldn't have done that, right? Law of large numbers, long term, half of the time it's going to be better, half of the time it's going to be worse. You might get one of those streaks where two or three times in a row you kind of kick yourself, but then you're also going to get two or three streaks where it was better to not touch the trade. So the signal is to get into the QLD over the weekend, right? That's the trade that you're looking at uh, right here. We, we got into that new trade and it is what it is. We'll see what happens on Monday. If you haven't taken the trade yet, then your price will be a little better than mine was, right? What's the XLU? Is that up at least? It's down too. So um, yeah, the market slid on both directions. Let's check gold. It's just obviously disgusting. Um, I hate gold, but... It's the best we got for a safety position. But yeah, your prices are a little better now. So you would just get into it. And it is what it is on Monday. That's it. We're in gold for this one. We're in cash for this one. We're in, you know, we'll have one position left on Monday and a couple of iron condors. And we go with what we have. That's it. I don't, I don't get into the intraday bouncing back and forth nonsense. I used to, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I used to think, 
day trading intraday was actually a good thing. It's not. It's just frustrating whipsaw constantly. And like I said, every second time you do it, you think, oh, I shouldn't have done that. So sometimes when I'm speaking on live streams, it might sound cold, like, ah, don't worry about it. Just get in and just go to sleep. It's fine. Uh, that's because 20 years in, I've seen it, done it all. It's experience, right? My emotions are just flatlined when I'm trading. But I understand that people following my work, especially because I'm just some random dude on Twitter that you probably found somewhere, right? We've never met in person. You know, there's a there's a barrier there where, you know, for all you know, I've made up everything. I've just, you know, manufactured it from just to make it look as good as possible. And you're just following some stranger online. So I understand that your emotions are going to be plenty different than mine. But for me, that wouldn't have even occurred to me. Um, glad you pointed it out. That's an interesting question. But I don't actually go back to the market half the time even. I take trades at the end of the day. Let's do that now because I do have to get into a wheel of fun, right? I've got two layers available. Sometimes, like right now, it's 2.30. I've got about an hour and a bit until market close. Probably I would normally wait until about 3.30. But like I said, I've ran a ton this month and I'm tired. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this now. I could do two layers, but this is a conservative layer and I'm not going to do that one. So let's just jump into this. It would have been better if I opened it a few minutes ago, right? An hour ago. But basically, what am I doing? So let's go through this. Here we are. First step, sell cash secured put, or let's do it here. Sell the cash secured put, kind of hoping, half hoping anyway that I get assigned and then I can really start churning stuff. So what should I do? Seven days out. I always like weekly cycles. And originally I had planned to do the 21, which was 20 cents at the start of the day. It's now only nine cents. 21.50 is 21 cents, that's worth selling. Anything over about 10 cents is technically worth selling if the price is in the 20s, right? Of course it scales with price. But um, 21.50, sound good? Let's do that. So again, this is going to be Although, how many contracts is this going to actually be? Um, let me get my calculator quickly. Because I, no, that's not the calculator. I basically set the money aside, 25,000 divided by 2150, did I say? How many can I get? 11. So I'm going to sell 11 contracts of the 2150, and I hope I get something. 11. Wow, I'm tired. I almost just sent that with one contract. Let's hope I can get 20 cents. Let's see what I get. 30 second rule. We always talk about it. You know, these are computers. It matches up quickly, but typically I'll wait about 30 seconds. I'm not going to now, uh, but I would wait if I don't get it. You just drop it down a penny and you just keep going. 19 cents is worth selling. It's not the best, but it's worth selling. So my spreadsheet's gonna beach ball on me here. For anybody who doesn't use a Mac, sometimes people are like, what is a beach ball? You can't see it, it probably just looks like a cursor, but if you've never used a Mac before, right now my cursor is spinning and it looks like a, like a spinning beach ball. Um, this is not gonna work, it's gonna crash my spreadsheet. So enough of that nonsense. But that's it, I'm in that trade, so um, I basically just come back in seven days and I kind of hoping, right? Because like I said before, it is a short vol strategy. It doesn't feel like it, but um, when you're doing these, this one, short UVXY put options, you think, oh, well, no, that's not a short vol trade, right? Obviously what I'm hoping for is, I'm just clicking around at this point. I seem to be sleepy. You'd think, oh no, I, what I actually want is I want the price to stay here or even go up and I'll just make this easy profit. No, it's short vol. What I want to happen is I want it to go to 21.49 and I want to get assigned at 21.50 so I can turn around and sell a big at the money covered call. And if you look at that, seven days out, an at the money covered call is going to pay, you know, 75, a dollar, sometimes $2 for those contracts. Let's look at some of these. It's still beach balling. Sorry, folks, I, I can't open that spreadsheet. Still beach balling. But that covered call is gonna pay me. That's where I'm gonna get paid on my way out the door. So that's kind of what I'm hoping for. 
selling short put options, I consider it, I will call it a quasi short volatility strategy. So there you go. I got through all the questions. I didn't fall asleep. And we went over eight ways to short the UVXY. So if any of those stood out to you and you want a dedicated tutorial, make sure you leave a comment. Of course, if you're here, I should have said this at the beginning, but I'm saying it now, please give the video a thumbs up. I, I'm a terrible YouTuber. I never do that thing like thumbs up, subscribe, you know, there's a free trial on my website. It's, you know, it's cheap. Go sign up now. I never do. And I always forget everything. So here we are an hour and a half in. everybody's leaving and I'm saying do all those things. But please, on your way out the door, give it a thumbs up. It doesn't cost you anything. And um, I think next Friday, I believe my sommelier wife is has set up another awesome wine tasting for me. So I don't think next Friday we'll be live streaming. If something really interesting happens in the market, I could do it Thursday. But otherwise, I will see you in two weeks. Thanks, everybody, for coming.